Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, this conference is taking place on the occasion of uh, the awarding of the Václav Havel Human Rights Prize. This is a prize that we present every year together with the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and our friends in the Charter 77 Foundation. Uh, the first uh, prize was presented in 2013 and it comes uh, with a reward of 60,000 euros. Of the six laureates so far, four are in prison or have recently served a prison term. This may be the best illustration of the importance of the struggle for human rights and of the extremely difficult conditions under which it is also taking place. It is often taking place. This year, for the first time, the selection panel has chosen not one, but two of the 28 candidates and three finalists. I believe that this verdict of the panel perfectly illustrates the universal character and the universal importance of human rights, regardless of geography, political systems, cultures, religions, gender, or age. The longing for freedom is a universal part of the human makeup, and the struggle for human rights is its outward expression. I will now invite the three finalists of this year's prize, or their representatives, to the stage. The runner-up this year was Buzugmer Yorov, a Tajikistan human rights lawyer representing individuals prosecuted by the government of Tajikistan on charges deemed politically motivated. He became targeted by the government for his work and in 2015 was charged by the government for a number of alleged offenses, including extremism, and sentenced to 28 years in prison. He is currently still in jail and will be represented at this conference by his brother, Yamshad Yorov. Please. Now we will come to the two core laureates this year. Professor Ilham Tohti, an economics professor at Minsu University in Beijing, has demonstrated an unparalleled commitment to peaceful dialogue between Uyghur, Uyghurs, Uyghurs sorry, and the Han Chinese majority in China. Despite Ilham Tohti's dedication to nonviolence and reconciliation, in September 2014, a court in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in Northwest China unjustly sentenced him to life in prison on the charge of separatism. Professor Tohti's courageous work embodied precisely the kind of insight and guidance on internet problems that should be embraced by Chinese officials who have instead chosen to silence Professor Tohti and to carry out a comprehensive program of repression of the Uyghur community and other Muslim groups in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Professor Tohti will be represented at this conference by Enver Khan, a member of the initiative to free Ilham Tohti. Mr. Khan. And last, but certainly not least, 
the second co-laureate of this year's Václav Havel Human Rights Prize became the Youth Initiative for Human Rights in Balkans, which was established in 2003 to actively contribute to the process of regional post-war reconciliation on the basis of justice, facts, and focus on perspective of victims through active participation of youth. It is an independent, non-profit, non-partisan, and youth-led network composed of five national, locally registered organizations in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Kosovo, Montenegro, and Serbia. And I understand that a new organization in Macedonia will soon join them. The regional exchange program is the most important program of the initiative. It started in 2003, firstly between Kosovo and Serbia, and spread across the region within several years. Up to date, over 16,000 people participated in numerous specific exchanges organized by the initiative. The initiative will be represented at this conference by Ivan Durich, director of its Belgrade office. Ivan, please. Uh, I will now ask our three guests, uh, starting with Mr. Yorov, to uh, speak. Uh, for about 15 minutes and after they finish I will pose a few questions and I hope that uh, our friends in the audience will use will make use of our uh, online interactive uh, question system to pose questions of their own so Mr. Yorov please Good morning, good morning, friends, good morning. I'm happy to be here and I want to thank on behalf of my brother who was nominated for the uh, Václav Havel Human Rights Award. I appreciate it very much and it is very symbolic because it also symbolizes the interconnection between their activities that I see. My Buzorkev Yorov has been fighting and he's still fighting with limited resources and he's fighting against the totalitarian regime. As you probably know, Tajikistan is a country that was under the Soviet rule and the Soviet Union was a communist regime. After the breakdown of the Soviet Union, Tajikistan is not a part of the Union anymore, but it still seats itself in as a communist country, uh, despite the fact that it is not titled as such. Uh, 
И после соглашения о мирном урегулировании этого процесса в 1997 году Таджикистан стал более-менее продвигаться на пути демократического преобразования. In the 90s, there have been some attempts to democratize our country. Then there was the civil war. The civil war was triggered by the Russian Federation. It was possible to settle the conflict in 1997. And since then, we have seen some attempts to switch to democracy. There have been some attempts to democratize our country. However, in my country, we have our president. He has been in power for 28 years already. According to the current legislature, he is entitled for his office for his whole life. And in time, these attempts to democratize our country became useless. And uh, finally, we see walls uh, being built, the walls that are the topics of our conference today. These walls are not only virtual, but also real walls. There are new walls that appear. They divide our people, not only from the ideological point of view, but also from the political and religious point of view. And there are also walls that start to being built between the destinies of our people. My brother worked as an um, advocate. He was also a member of the SIPAR Association, an association who helped the people who opposed uh, decisions by courts. These were people who disagreed that their companies or challenged the fact that their companies, for instance, had been overtaken by uh, others based on judicial decisions. When my brother was arrested 15 years ago, and also my arrest later, was conducted on the grounds that on the 4th of September 2015, according to the government bodies, there had been an attempt to uh, of a political putsch in our country. My brother was then charged in the first of the judicial uh, review, and uh, he was then uh, also charged in another three cases, and uh, 
he was uh, charged with crimes such as defamation of a government office, the defamation of the president, uh, blackmailing, uh, causing political and racial hatred, and finally he had been sentenced to 28 years in prison. In my country, we have very, a very repressive regime, and it is even difficult to find a legal counsel for my brother. It was nearly impossible to find a lawyer who would take the case. The first legal counsel who defended my brother is right now in prison himself, and he was sentenced to 21 years in prison. His name is Nuridi. And the last lawyer who represented my brother is currently in exile in a European country. She was the victim of blackmailing and threats. And today in Tajikistan, there is not the, free possi the possibility to defend yourself freely in front of a court. We now stay abroad, we have emigrated, and our objective today is to pass the message to explain what is the situation like in Tajikistan and also communicate to our people living in the country and also to, to the diplomats, to the large public, to the international human rights organizations and others. I'm happy and I am honored by the fact that my brother was nominated for the Václav Havel Award. The fact that he is among the three laureates is uh, great news, f an encouragement for the people in Tajikistan. And it is also hope for us. The fact that our small country, our small Tajikistan is uh, seen by the international community and that the international community sees the difficulties that we are having, we are very happy to see that these difficulties are also seen by others. Now, I would like to pass you the message of my brother, Busur Mekhar, who four days ago 
through intermediaries and through, through family mem members pass this message to me for you. Thank, let me thank you very much for the nomination. And uh, I appreciate very much and I'm honored with your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yorov, for these words and for the message from uh, your brother. And I would also like to thank you for reminding us of something that we sometimes forget. We in the West often have a rather cynical perspective of lawyers and say things which are not very nice about them. And it's, it's good to realize that uh, lawyers like your brother, that it is also a high risk profession and that uh, the integrity and the courage of lawyers like these provides an essential service to any society. Thank you. Before I give the floor to Mr. Khan on behalf of Ilham Tohti, uh, I would like to recognize one very special guest here. Uh, Dagmar Havlova is the co-founder of the Václav Havel Library, also the leader of the uh, Vision 97 Foundation, which restored this beautiful church, and the widow of the late President Havel. Welcome, Dagmar. <laughs> now, I, I will open it for you. <laughs> but the floor is yours now. That's right. You don't have to stand. Enver. You, you okay. can yeah, you can please go ahead. Distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen. We Uyghurs now some 15 million people are one of the ancient peoples in Central Asia. And through the historical Silk Road, the Uyghur land was the crossroads for diverse religions and cultures. The res result was developing of a, a rich civilization and open society in the region. Historically, the religions like Buddhism from India, Manichaeism from Persia, the Nestorian Christianity from the Middle East left deep signs in the Uyghur land. At the beginning of the 20th century, some Western scholars who made expeditions to our land expressed the admiration to the state of Uyghur culture. To give some examples, Ferdinand Zasso says, quote, it was the Uyghurs who saved the culture in practice and in writings. Albert Lecoq, the Uyghur language and script enriched the civilization of other peoples of Central Asia. Laszlo Razonie writes, the Uyghurs published books centuries before Gutenberg found the art of printing. And according to Wolfram Eberhardt, in the Middle Ages, the Uyghurs influenced the Chinese poetry, literature, theater, music, and painting, end of quote. 
today these people who contributed so much to the regional and world civilization are under threat of disappearing. Thus, the Chinese government's policy in the Uyghur homeland is nothing less than cultural genocide aimed at gaining total control over the population and eliminating their unique language, traditions, and faith. The situation indeed is the worst since the Chinese Communist Party took over in 1949. The Communist Party is sparing no expense. It is spending millions of dollars in expanding prisons, converting ordinary buildings into prison camps, and building new internment camps to hold a West member of Uyghurs in secret, indefinite definition, detention. It is also spending millions of dollars to deploy the latest technological innovations to establish a powerful police state, creating complete 24-7 surveillance over the population, including Uyghurs' home, homes. The camps hold over one million people and possibly as many as two million people in extrajudicial, extra-legal detentions purely on the basis of the ethno-religious identity. Inside these camps, victims have reported detainees are forced to renounce their faith and identity, sing the prizes of the Communist Party, Xi Jinping, survivors report having to say over and over again, my soil is infected with serious diseases. There is no God, I don't believe in God. I believe in the Communist Party. Those in the camps are subject unspeakable conditions and subject to unspeakable conditions and starvation diet. Brutal torture, including electric shocks, are widespread. Unexplained medical tests such as blood tests, ultrasound, and body scans have also been reported, raising the awful possibility that detainees' organs are being examined for possible use in transplant surgery, a procedure that would mean the death of the prisoners. There are reports of so-called halal organ harvesting aimed at customers from Muslim world and the Middle East especially. Forced labor in connection with the extra-legal detention is now well documented. Investigative reporting has uncovered export of these goods to American and other Western consumers via Baja Sportwear, Target, Cotton On, Jeans West, IKEA, and the H&M companies. The purpose of the camps is clear, to brainwash and exert tight control over Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples. However, this campaign of dehumanization and cultural genocide reaches beyond the walls of the camps to every corner of the Uyghur society. Uyghurs are not even free in their own homes. Communist Party members are sent to stay with them and observe them for any hint of disloyalty. At least a million officials have been sent to live in Uyghur homes in the so-called becoming a family, a family of friendship campaign. Forced marriages are common. Children have been taken away from their parents and placed in state, state orphanages where 
they are indoctrinated through repeated loyalty oaths. In May, Vice News used a hidden camera to film morning exercise where the children were forced to say in unison, I will protect the unification of the motherland and unity among ethnicities. We are Chinese and we love China, among other slogans. These children and all Uyghur families will suffer lasting trauma. The policy is clearly designed to cut off the transmission of Uyghur cultures to the next generation. A government official has described this policy as break their lineage, break their roots, break their connections, break their origins. The Uyghur language has been completely eliminated from schools, with Uyghur teachers pushed out and Han Chinese hired to replace them. Recent UHRP has documented the, the detention or enforced disappearance of at least 435 professors, journalists, poets, musicians, and other guardians of Uyghur history culture and real identity. A large number of cemeteries have already been erased and paved over. Thousands of mosques and shrines have been demolished. This has been called the first postmodern genocide. The Chinese government's gross human rights crimes, the systematic brutalization of the people and the erasure of their identity call for an urgent global response. A recent a witness last year on the Uyghur crisis noted that st staying silent on human rights in China is not a neutral act. Silence in face of mass atrocities is a green light for continued crimes. Under these circumstances, the Václav Havel Human Rights Prize is a significant recognition by the Western democratic community of Ilham Tohti's work for human rights and freedom of his people. It will no doubt contribute to his survival behind the bars and give the Uyghur people another impulse to continue resisting against oppression. Today, the prize, the day, two days ago, the prize is distinguishing one person, but doing so is recognizing a whole population and giving the downtrodden a voice. As a pensioner, after the verdict of Ilham Tohti to life sentence in prison, I found it with the help of my German, French, and Belgian friends, the Ilham Tohti initiative to promote him and his vision around the world. The last and the best result of our voluntary work is the award named after your, our common hero, Václav Havel, who is one of the first runners, pioneers of democracy, freedom, justice, and respect for human rights, not only in Europe, but beyond. The best example of the beyond is echoed on Tuesday when Myself and Ivan, we jointly received the 2019 Vastav Havel Prize for Human Rights. As a simple human rights activist, I would like to say the work and bravery of legendary figures like late Vastav Havel is an inspiration for many more around the world. 
and I'm sure Ilham Tohti is one of them. Thus, he sacrificed his life, family, property, and everything for justice, rule of law, friendship among different ethnicities in China, and for the rights and freedom of his people. As I said before, the Václav Havel Human Rights Prize is a significant recognition by the Western democratic community of Ilham Tohti's work for human rights and his people. It will, no doubt, contribute to his survival behind the bars. Today, the prize is distinguishing one person, but by doing so, is recognizing a whole population in giving the downtrodden a voice. For it is an entire population of Uyghurs that look for you, look, look to you for uh, for help. It is also an the Vaslav Havel Human Rights Prize is hereby sending a strong signal to the communist rulers in Beijing who question the Western values, indicating that the free democratic world will not tolerate the continued violations against human rights. I stand before you as one man, but millions of Uyghurs behind me who all thank you for your consideration of and attention towards our plight. This is a milestone in our continued fight to free Ilham Tohti, and we will continue our fight until he and every last unjustly imprisoned person is freed. Thus, I express the sincere thanks of Ilham Tohti, his family, and also the gratitude of the Uyghur people as a whole to Václav Havel Library and the Charter 77 Foundation. Actually, all Czech people for choosing him for the prestigious prize and salute late Václav Havel for his courageous fight for freedom, democracy, and justice, which is a landmark to the future. It is an honor for me today to be among you after receiving an international human rights prize named after your hero, Václav Havel, on behalf of my hero, Ilham Tohti. Thank you very much from my bottom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Khan, for your words, for paying homage to the legacy of uh, Václav Havel, which we all hold dear, and also for your description of the plight of the Uyghur people. Uh, we are unfortunately not always well informed about what is going on in the Uyghur region because of the distance, because of the remoteness of the region, but mainly because of uh, the fact that the Chinese government suppresses the information from the region. So it's extremely important for us to have uh, someone like you who is uh, competent and qualified to uh, speak about it. Uh, now we will move to the Youth Initiative for Human Rights and to our friend Ivan Durich uh, who will hopefully tell us something more optimistic about uh, uh, a, a region closer to uh, us. Ivan, please. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here in this beautiful venue. I'm very impressed still. Uh, 
yes, I'm, I would like to, to, to talk about the region which is much closer to, to, to here, but still s there is such a misunderstanding between us and the rest of Europe. I think it, uh, when we talk about the walls that fell 30 years ago, actually at the same time as the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall were falling, in former Yugoslavia, wars were prepared and it's, they started in 1991 and until 1999, basically we were fighting for this legacy of, of former Yugoslavia, wars based on nationalism, ethnic hatred, and you would think that after 20 years something is, is, is getting better. Well, in fact, I'm here to say that we are afraid it's not. We are afraid that we are in the Balkans still living in a ceasefire, not living in peace. We are afraid that the regional cooperation between our countries is schizophrenic, I would say, because you have high-level politicians meeting, discussing and making some agreements even, which are good for the countries, but then they come back to their, to their respective countries and continue to build these psychological walls that you were talking about in the beginning. Uh, Youth Initiative for Human Rights is a regional network of young activists who are trying to tear down those psychological walls, to promote the idea that cooperation among people in the Balkans is a priority, that it's something that is needed, that this is something that is natural, and that this is something uh, that is crucial for our prosperity. This cooperation is burdened by the legacy of the wars. Uh, like I said, nationalisms that led to wars are not, are not toned down now, how, how to say. They are, they are voluming up because young generations born after the wars have no experience, their personal authentic experience on, on the other of a Croat or a Kosovar or Bosniak, if they come from Serbia, they have no personal experience. They only, they, their information comes from their family or school or media, public space, which is poisoned by prejudice, stereotypes, and, and hatred. And this is what we are trying to fight. We do that on, uh, uh, by providing people uh, opportunities for these personal experiences and getting to know each other through exchange programs, something similar that uh, France and Germany started a decade after the Second World War through Franco-German Youth Office. We are also working a lot on education, educating young people on this recent history because what you uh, learn at school or what is information that are provided to you by mainstream media, they're just false. They are uh, in narrative, ethnocentric narratives which will teach you that your country, your people, they are the only victims and all of the others are the only criminals. In my country, Serbia, this is also uh, adding, adding up to this, is the uh, injustice and the animosity of the Western world towards Serbia. So we are alone, lonely victims, closing in our, in our own ethnical, ethnical circle. And now, 20 years after the wars, we are still afraid that this closing up in ethnical, ethnical groups and uh, can lead to another conflict in the, in the near future. As you know, uh, the, 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 the Kosovo issue is still not resolved. The borders of Kosovo are still discussed on highest levels. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, also its integrity is questioned daily by uh, ethnic ethnic politicians from different ethnical groups in the, in the country. So this is, uh, these are main causes of instability in the region. 
to turn on a positive note what you have asked, what we, I believe, we need more in the future in order to prevent future conflicts is first dealing with the past and what has happened and uh, mutual apologies is for war crimes, which we do not have for 15 years now. They started in the beginning of 2000s, but then they stopped and now we are still trenched in our ethnical groups. We need to apologize for war crimes committed on each side. We need more Europe in our region, not only EU integration, but EU integration is vital, but more European values, more European discussions. I believe that we need to be included, especially young generations of, of us in the Western Balkans, we need to be included in these discussions on the future of, future of Europe, how the European Union is going to look like if the big reform is coming up. We are also supposed to be involved in this discussion as we are also Europeans and will be part of the, of the Union hopefully soon. We need, the, uh, I'm, 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 we are of course very honored with this award, but what I take most out of, out of getting this award is that this recognition by the, by the Council of Europe and the selection panel that peace process, peace building process in the Balkans is not finished yet, that it needs more impulse, it needs help, it needs attention of Europe. And this is something that we have to work on. We need uh, more, uh, uh, more, uh, how to, more Russian-like approach to the Western Balkans from, from Europe. Russia is very active promoting its values, promoting its country, promoting its system, very active in our country through media, through public appearances, through propaganda. We need something like that from the European Union, from the Western uh, Europe in our country. It's not, it's not enough only to be neutral, it's not enough only to wait for our countries to fulfill conditions for accession. No, we need some kind of incentive, we need support for, the, for our societies or parts of our societies that share European values. We really need that kind of support and we feel that in, in this prize and this is why we are we are very happy and honored. I'm sure that uh, there is a way out of this current crisis. I believe that with this cooperation with, with Europe and these progressive parts of our societies, we can go on the right path. But currently, like I said, the situation is it's, it's risky. It's risky which way our societies would go. Will it be path of cooperation or it will be a path of conflict? 30 years ago, our societies and our leaders made the wrong choice. They are still not, still not condemned by our societies for making that wrong choice. Those who led us to wars, who led the wars, who committed war crimes, they're not seen as bad guys yet. And this is something, something that, that I believe is crucial for uh, the, the, the imposing of new value system that can bring us to democracy, rule of law, prosperity, regional cooperation, and at the end, European integration. Let's put it this way. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, and, and I think you said something very important. If uh, the Václav Havel Human Rights Prize can help to bring more attention to the situation in the Western Balkans and to your activities and your hopes and to the struggle of people like Buzuk Meryorov in Tajikistan and Ilval Tohti in, in, in the Uyghur region, then it will have served its purpose. It's, it's what it's all about. Now we have a, a few minutes left for questions, for, for discussion. 
we have some questions from the audience, but I will, I will start by posing a question to all of you because this is something that I keep asking myself and again and again. What has motivated someone like Buzuk Mayorov to give up a very profitable career in uh, legal services, uh, maybe serving the government, uh, making well for himself and for his family, and to take up the cause of political prisoners and of the defense of human rights. What motivated your friend, Professor Tohti? He was a, I believe he was even a member of the Communist Party at one time and gave up a very promising academic career and take up the uh, cause of the reconciliation between the Uyghur and the Khan people. And what motivates you and your friends, Ivan, uh, instead of starting businesses and companies and uh, to spend uh, so much effort and time on something as not profitable as a struggle for human rights, for reconciliation, for better understanding among the people of your region. Could you enlighten us on that? нарушением прав человека. Это было даже в то время, когда он учился в школе, и у нас э, в стране, в бывшем Советском Союзе, была такая организация Коммунистический Союз Молодежи. Это еще те люди, которые не стали коммунистами, но готовились стать коммунистами. Бузургмехар был председателем вот этой Коммунистического Союза Молодежи нашей школы. И он очень был справедливым, очень был дисциплинирован и принципиальным. И вот эта принципиальность, эта э, приверженность своим идеалам э, послужила тому, что он, да, действительно, ему предлагали должность судьи. Он не пошел служить властям и стал судьей, а можно так сказать, что он пострадал за свои идеалы, за свои принципы, за свои прирожденные чувства справедливости и борьбы с дискриминацией. I believe that uh, my brother has an innate desire for justice and uh, a resistance against anything which is an unjust. Uh, he, uh, during the Soviet Union era, era, there existed the Communist Union of the Youth, and these were non-members of the Communist Party, but young people who were preparing to become members, and he was the head of that organization at our school, and he was uh, very, uh, he was showing these qualities of being very fair, very uh, just, and he was asked to become a judge at that, po uh, at that point, and he decided not to take up this uh, role because he was so principled, and he continued to be that uh, until today. Uh, it is uh, a human common responsibility, a common values, uh, and human consciousness to stand up against injustice, to be short. These are the elements needed. And he gave up everything for this cause. And I think, I admire him personally. I admire him personally. Uh, so as a pensioner, I said, we should do something. Thank you. Thank you. Ivan? 
<coughs> well, for me, uh, personally, my main motive still is to counter this narrative that exists in our society that you are a traitor if you speak about war crimes committed by your army and paramilitary. I believe my whole body and soul feels completely opposite, that speaking about and condemning war crimes committed by army and government of my people, that's the most patriotic thing to do, that this is the, the, the trying to get in on the moral side is to be, that is the most important thing for me, the motive is to say no, not all Serbs are criminals and the only way to say that is to point out individuals who are convicted before the court for committing war and stop supporting them and their ideas and their ideologies and stop creating heroes out of them. Indeed. And, well, this leads me directly to one question from the audience for all our speakers. What do you think about the universality of human rights? Is the concept of human rights really applicable around the world? Or is it a matter of each country and its cultures as some of the undemocratic regimes are arguing? <coughs> Please start. I think human rights is universal. Uh, and it is applicable should be applicable when we don't think about, when we don't put it, put the economic interests above the human values and the universality of the human rights. But unfortunately, my personal point of view is for decades I saw double standards in the implementation of human rights, double standards speaking up, bringing up human rights issues, uh, and I saw also a lack of constance, lack of insistence, and the lack of real seriousness. The result is as it was in the past, dictatorial regimes misused these kind of position and still misusing more and more. And I, I don't hope so, but this would lead in one day that we will be feeding or cooperating with regimes at the end who does not respect the whole ethics values of the humanity. Thank you. Thank you. I strongly, I strongly believe that human rights are universal and this is one of the, or probably the most ambitious goal that so society has set for itself the global society, let's say, the international community. And it's only 70 years or something that this principle is standing. So I do believe we need more time to achieve this goal. But at some point, if we stay, if we stay focused and believe in this, I believe we will. If you, if you take the, the 40s or the 50s when these principles were building up, how many countries in the world were truly free and democratic and how many are now. There is progress on global level, there is strong progress and I do not believe that cultures where dignity for some people does not exist, I don't believe that these cultures are natural, they are authentic. I believe that then this is some kind of propaganda of those in power in order not to lose power whether we talk political power or we talk about relations of men and women or other vulnerable groups and minorities. There is, it's not normal, it's not in a human nature to stay
take away someone's someone's dignity and I strongly believe in that. Thank you. Perhaps there are differences. Perhaps there are differences between us. We may differ in the color of eyes and hair and skin, but we are all the same inside. But inside, we have the same phys physical, physiological, and psychological needs. And these needs are linked to uh, freedoms and liberties, as these are described in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There cannot be any exclusions or exceptions based on a race, a political belief, or um, affiliation with a specific system. Rights and freedoms are innate since birth, and the rule of law is one that can secure flourishment of these rights in the future. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, when Mr. Khan was speaking about the double standards that some countries are applying to the issues of human rights in, in countries like, like China, I, I just wish some of our top political leaders could be here to, to hear that, uh, but uh, maybe uh, someone will tell them. Uh, but it is directly linked to the next question that came from the audience. How can we in the Czech Republic help the human rights activists uh, in countries such as yours? How, you, you can, ex How can we help? Oh. What can we do to help? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, let me please uh, go back a little bit when China joined the World Trade Association. Since then, at that time, there was an atmosphere in Western Europe, in the world, that we benefit, there is a common benefit, mutual benefit, we exchange goods, we exchange ideas, and sometime in the future, we can see a more open, more liberal government in China and help to create a open society. And it is, I think, uh, two decades now, uh, with, with this agreement, China got stronger, made a lot of money, bought weapons with this money, and trying to influence, to assert its expansionistic policy globally. On the other hand, with this money, suppressing its own people, and we in the West, we suffered that I know, if not hundreds of thousands, thousands of Western companies went bankrupt 
due to the dumping price, price by China. So in this case, I think researchers, our politicians, uh, I think they are thinking or they should think about. So as I said, are we feeding a wrong horse? Thank you. Uh, I, I cannot resist asking you, Enver, is this an Uyghur saying? Are we feeding the wrong horse? It is universal, I think. I heard <laughs> in many cultures. <laughs> I, I heard in many cultures. <laughs> All right. Чехия внести в список так называемый список магнитского тех лиц, которые причастны к грубым нарушениям прав человека в Таджикистане. Может Чехия ввести какие-то санкции, индивидуальные или государственные, в отношении диктаторского режима Инамали Рахмона. Но так как я еще не могу ответить полностью, как может именно Чехия нам помочь, и ответа полного нету. Когда будет ответ, я вам обязательно пришлю. I probably cannot give you an exact answer to the question how the Czech Republic can help specifically, but in general, let me say that the Czech Republic can help with information. You can help the in opposition in Tajikistan. You can help provide finance. You can also think about joining the countries that have already included the Magnitsky's list in their legal framework. And uh, you can consider joining other entities who are close to the Tajikistan opposition. And you can initiate um, something for the um, representatives of Tajikistan. But I cannot give you uh, an exact answer now, but once I have all the relevant information, I'll give you a specific answer. Thank you. Well, uh, Serbian president is coming tomorrow here, so th this is one of the one of the opportunities. I'm joking. From the Czech Republic in the region, first we need uh, stop the, 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 the stop to these discussions on their recognition of Kosovo. This is the first thing that we need from the Czech Republic. <laughs> from the officials. And the second thing we need, like I said, for building of peace in the Balkans, one of the priorities is EU membership of all countries of the region. But it's not only that we need signatures, you know, from the European Council and our governments, presidents, and we have joined Europe. We need to build support while we build support in the region for this EU membership. We would need help in building support in European citizens of this membership to that we are a part of Europe and should be part of the European Union. We do not need, we must now start preparing for this process of referendums, probably in some countries. We need support of the citizens of the European Union for the membership of Western Balkan countries. Thank you. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more question, and I will ask you to be as brief as possible. But it's an important question because we will discuss it at more length at a later, in a later panel. Are modern technologies such as internet and the social media helping you in your fight for human rights or not because of fake news and things like that? Is it any help, the social media? 
Okay. Okay. Yes. I ask you to be brief. This is as brief as can be. Yeah. <laughs> Especially helping uh, our people in diaspora uh, that they get immediately the information in seconds, in minutes, what's happening at home and what we are doing to help them. And for example, like Vastav Havel Human Rights Prize, uh, after lunch when I came, after, uh, after lunch, it was one hour after its announcement, so I have re been receiving uh, reactions, uh, thanks from around the world. So that's a good example. I'm right. brief. Thank you. Very briefly, and yes, and no. Like in all other aspects of, of life. Yes, now it's easier to share information, to connect to other people, but it's also much easier to share misinformation, to share uh, false news, to, 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 to make threats, to be, to be very hateful and violent on the internet. So like in other, other fields, it's, it's that simple. Uh, uh, we will probably speak about it later, but the, the, this flow of information has, as you know, reduced the value of knowledge and facts because now everyone has an information and whether that is uh, factual or not is not that important anymore. So this is what is, what is really hard for our work and our mission that we are trying to promote truth and, and facts. Thank you. Да, можно. Для нас таджикская оппозиция, особенности для национального альянса Таджикистана, интернет и средства электронные средства массовой информации это единственный пока способ общаться со своим народом, донести до них правильную действительную ситуацию с правами человека в Таджикистане. Хотя в Таджикистан систематически, несмотря на некоторые ситуации в стране, на несколько дней полностью отключается от интернета все yes it can help and it helps at least and in particular in Tajikistan and it helps mainly the opposition forces associated in the national alliance of Tajikistan the internet is for us basically the only means to inform our people in Tajikistan about the situations and events related to human rights. But it should be noted that the internet very often is very often disconnected sometimes for a couple of days and in this way the spread of information is blocked. Yamshat Yorov, Ivan Durich, Enver Khan, thank you. And great. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now have a 15 minute break. Please be in your seats in 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>